Every word matters here on World Talks. I'm Anna Kalczynska. Good evening and welcome to the discussion on the main topics of the day. Geopolitically most important topics, namely opening of the first air defense base in northern Poland, Redzikovo, US-NATO talks in Brussels, as well as Biden-Trump meeting in Washington. And joining me to comment on these three major developments is Mark Toth, national security expert. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Anna. Thank you for having me. Good evening, Mark. It's been uh, stressed by the Polish officials, Redzikovo base is a deal of several consecutive Polish and American administrations. Could you tell us what is its actual strategic importance? How significant it is for the region? Uh, it, it's a key building block in terms of building a missile shield for Europe. Uh, and, and certainly what we've seen Russia doing inside of Ukraine uh, the need for it now is now more than ever. Um, you know, for instance, earlier this summer, the Wall Street Journal was reporting that in terms of vital NATO infrastructure throughout Europe, roughly only 20 percent of it is covered by missile defense systems. And so the building of this base, the official opening that just happened, is key. It's, it's the first step. Now, now, what we're seeing here, uh, just for viewers that may not be familiar with it, this is what's called is Aegis Ashore. It's a missile defense system that's based, or it's, it's actually a U.S. Navy system that's on Aegis ships, such as destroyers and cruisers, uh, that, that patrol the oceans. Uh, but it's a land-based version of it. It uses the same deck uh, house. It uses the same missile systems. It uses the same kind of radar uh, that's known as an AN slash uh, SPI-1 uh, type radar. And, and it does the same thing that, that those systems do. It searches, it detects, um, it tracks incoming missiles, uh, and it also uh, discriminates so that it can determine whether the threats are not. So it's, it's a vital installation. And, and for now, these have been situated or calibrated, if you will, to protect Europe from uh, threats coming from the Middle East, but they could easily be programmed uh, in terms of protecting threats coming from Russia or in terms of your own country, even closer by in Kaliningrad, uh, the Russian exclave. So it's an absolutely defense system, yet the Moscow perceives it as a threat. So if you could just say in few basic words why this system cannot in no possible way constitute a threat to Russia. Right. Uh, simply put, it's, it's a defensive missile system intended to shoot down incoming missiles. That's all it does. It's, it's not a HIMARS system. It's not something that can, or an ATACMS or something like the Taurus missile in Germany. It's incapable of going out and, and hitting targets uh, that are not incoming. It's designed to focus on inner ballistic missiles. So those are coming from space. So, you know, for Russia to say that is, is frankly hogwash. Uh, it's, it's a missile defense system that's, that's purely designed uh, to stop any potential Russian threats. Uh, the only thing that it threatens Russia is its ability to strike Europe, and that's what they're upset about. Okay, and what is the relation between the U.S. commanders and NATO commanders? This base is under uh, the U.S. commander-in-chief, right? So what is the relation right. with, I mean, uh, with NATO? Right. I mean, this may come to surprise to some viewers, but it's actually a U.S. Navy facility uh, because it's their system. It's similar in design to the THAAD system that the U.S. Army uses and people may have heard of most recently as it's been deployed to Israel uh, in terms of protecting against Iranian attacks. But it's the U.S. Navy one. Eventually, this will be fully integrated under NATO, though, and it will fall under NATO's command and control structure, just as other U.S. assets and forces in the region do. So it's definitely going to become a key component to, to NATO. Not only is this facility here uh, that's uh, being established in Poland, but there's also an additional one in uh, Romania. And then there'll be coordination because there are U.S. Navy destroyers that are based in Rota, Spain, for instance, that also use this system that, that can form an even bigger shield, if you will, when collectively used. And then there's even uh, as far away as Turkey, uh, early warning systems and the like radar that is used to, to complement the system and to give it even more reach uh, in, in, in terms of what it can detect. OK, now let's turn to politics, because it, it, uh, the opening of the base is very symbolic. It happens just today and uh, just as um, uh, the incumbent president and new, no, new president is about to meet in the White House. So the Polish government says the opening demonstrates Poland's military alliance with Washington is solid. Whoever is in the White House, 
And, um, and Mark Brzeziński, um, the U.S. ambassador to Warsaw, says that uh, we will see more synchronicity and more cooperation with the U.S. military and that this country is safe, very important words. But how would you comment on that regarding the change in the White House? Right, yeah, it's brilliant for you to hit on this point of messaging because this is messaging all the way around. It is the United States making it clear to Poland as well as to Russia that the U.S. is here to stay. Uh, and in terms of the messaging that ultimately will come from Trump, I think you'll see much more of the same. He and Duda share a good relationship, and that's a, a, a good place for Poland to be as a country. Uh, likewise, you know, in terms of what uh, Trump wants to see from NATO, more collective spending, more burden being shared by Europe. If you think about it, your country has set the gold standard for that. Your own defense spending, your commitment to building new fortification lines along your your uh, borders with Russia, et cetera, are really leading Europe in, in ways that no other country, save perhaps obviously Ukraine, and actually fighting a kinetic fight are doing. So I, I think this relationship is only going to get stronger. I don't say that politically. Uh, from my standpoint, I'm apolitical, but from a military standpoint, I think this relationship between Poland and the Trump administration will only get stronger because uh, Poland represents everything that Trump wants to see out of other uh, NATO member states. Thank you very much for this optimistic note. And now turning to Brussels, important talks today as well. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken um, was there. So what is the significance of probably one of the late last visits of Blinken to Brussels? Right. Yeah, I, I think some of it is, is simply uh, Blinken trying to wrap up, getting ready to do a handoff. He may be providing uh, insight behind the scenes about how to identify uh, for NATO officials to uh, interact uh, with the new incoming administration. He may be giving insight on some of the, the appointees, you know, for instance, uh, be it a Mike Waltz as the national security advisor or Marco Rubio. I'm sorry, Marco Rubio as uh, the incoming secretary of state, his own replacement. Um, but really, it's just kind of a handoff. It's 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 a polite things. You know, I would hope, but we're just not seeing signs of it yet, that, that Blinken would be there to try to advance the case for accelerating aid to Ukraine. But we're just not seeing that yet in the tea leaves. We're still seeing the same kind of stall tactics that has kind of kept Ukraine in this purgatory in terms of its ability to take its fight deep into Russia so that it can uh, win the close fight along its borders, uh, not just in uh, the Donbass, but obviously the lodgment that it's done in the Kurds region in uh, Russia. And how about Marco Rubio, Secretary of State, the, to become, right, appointed by um, next president um, uh, Donald Trump? What is your opinion of him? Is he going to follow the lead of Anthony Blinken? Is he going to reshape this policy? How important a figure is he? Uh, he's going to be an important figure because he's the face of the State Department, obviously. And I think what you're going to see in terms of the differences is it's going to be night and day between what the Biden administration's approach was uh, to geopolitical kind of affairs. And, and I really think what we're looking at here, when you look at the different appointees so far announced, that uh, Trump is doubling down on the maximum pressure policy that he first implemented with respect to Iran. And I suspect that you'll start to see that rolled out on a global basis. Uh, so, you know, that will, will take shape in, in Eastern Europe in terms of Ukraine, in terms of what Russia is trying to do there. It'll take shape also, you know, in the Indo-Pacific in terms of trying to contain China and stop it from invading Taiwan. Uh, and, and you'll see it continue to take shape in the Middle East and it'll become kind of the forefront of it. And, and, and certainly from Rubio's standpoint, it will be his job, his task uh, to make those arguments that, look, maximum pressure is coming, get on board with it. The U.S. is no longer to, willing to tolerate these threats. And it's just one example. Uh, Rubio, right after he was appointed, was stopped in the hallways of Congress and asked, well, what about Hamas? And his, his answer was pretty firm. He's like, they're going to be destroyed every last one of them. And that's a market change. It's a complete support of saying, do what you need to do uh, to win this fight so that we don't give Iran or Russia a win here. I expect to see the same in Europe uh, coming out of Rubio. Okay. So let, now let's turn to Washington. President Biden, as mm -hmm. it was announced, is scheduled to host his successor at the White House. Uh, earlier, President-elect Trump began his visit to Washington uh, 
to Washington, to Washington by meeting with House Rep Republicans. He also brought Elon Musk. Um, let's have a look because, um, as I'm informed right now, uh, the meeting is about to um, to take place, or maybe is even right in in the very moment. Right, it's, it's, it takes it's place. taking place right yes, now. Right, right, exactly. So we're waiting just for. Um, two gentlemen, two uh, presidents to come out to journalists and to share their um, share views and opinions about this meeting. Uh, it's worth noting that it's a courtesy Mr. Trump did not extend to Mr. Biden after his losing election in 2020, right? Right. No, it is worth noting. This has been a decades long tradition. Uh, that presidents have done in terms of handing them off. Unfortunately, you know, from my standpoint, that didn't happen in 2020. Uh, it's something that is a courtesy that's important. But then again, this is tradition. It's kind of pomp and circumstance. I doubt anything meaningful other than perhaps an exchange of the latest intel that, that Trump has not yet been privy to in terms of global threats. Much is going on in this meeting. It's more a question of niceties between the incoming and outgoing of presidents, and it's it's meant to show unity in the country uh, that we do peaceful transfers of power. And so, and so basically what you're seeing here is somewhat theater in an organization, but it's important theater. It's important messaging, not only to the American public, but to our global allies and indeed to our foes that uh, the United States hands off power peacefully. Obviously, looking at this picture, our imagination flows. But you know, uh, could you imagine, for instance, that um, President Biden is somehow trying to talk into um, the President Donald Trump to follow his lead in uh, Ukraine, for instance? We've heard that uh, Joe Biden is uh, stepping up, um, passing uh, the military and the financial support to Ukraine. Do you think that uh, he's just simply? Um, uh, skeptical about uh, Donald Trump's uh, uh, continuity of this uh, line of policy? It's a fair question, and certainly Jake Sullivan, several days ago, Biden's national security advisor, talked along those lines that they wanted to use this interim period between um, uh, the election and when uh, Trump takes office on January 20th to try to convince uh, Trump to do his own, I mean, do the right thing in Ukraine. Um, I doubt it's going to have much of a substantive change in Trump's thinking. Uh, from his standpoint, Trump won. Uh, you've seen him roll out his national security team with, with quick pace just in the last two days here. And, and so I think from that standpoint, uh, while Biden may try, I really don't think uh, Trump is there to listen. I, I think he's just going through the motions of this, uh, doing uh, this more for optic reasons than anything else. I doubt anything substantive comes out of this meeting. Uh, but you're right. I, you know, I think Biden will try. But uh, given the margins that Trump won, uh, given that he won the trifecta, or is very close to doing it, winning the House, winning, I mean, almost winning the House, uh, some entities, including the Hill, whom I write for, uh, have called the House for him, but winning the Senate and the, the White House, he's going to control most likely all three branches. So um, I, I doubt that Biden's going to be able to say much to change Trump's mind. Thank you so much for this insight, Mark Toth. National security expert was our guest tonight. Thank you very much once again. So many things happening all around the world. Um, Mark Rutte, uh, the chief of NATO here in, uh, in Poland today, and um, meeting of um, um, NATO officials in Brussels as well with Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, as mentioned previously, and obviously the meeting in the White House, Joe Biden meeting Donald Trump. The news is uh, unfolding on your eyes. Uh, so please stay tuned to TVP World and stay close to us as news unfollows. <laughs>